Hit me. Shabbat Shalom. It is our custom that at this time we turn and find two or three people that we may or may not know and greet them and say hello and welcome them. So why don't you do that right now? Say hi to somebody. You got a tempo? Let me hear. What you got?
forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God you fight for me, Lord of A sign that you are with me A fire by night A guiding light to my feet You found me, you freed me Held back the waters for my release Oh Yahweh You're the God who fights for me Lord
winds run free at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand name is above each and every and every other name. Alvino, Malcano, our Father, our King, we cry out to you this Sabbath and proclaim that you are holy. You are holy. You are holy. And there is no one, there is none other beside thee, Father. We give you praise and honor to your name. Be glorified, I pray, in our midst as we lift up your holy name. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. We're going to bless our children now. I love doing this part. So if you are a young person, we would love the opportunity to bestow a blessing on you. So would you make your way down front and your parents can come with you? If you don't want to do that, you can extend a hand, but we're going to bless our children right now. Come on, let's do it. Probably the most important part of our morning, blessing our children, blessing our families. May the Lord, may the Lord protect and defend you. May He always shield you from shame. May you come to.
bless our children this morning? No pressure. All right, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I'm Victor LaBarbera. So before I get started, just want to plug an event. Uh, I think I was here two weeks ago, kind of mentioned it. But what we are planning for is July 30th, that weekend, last weekend in July. So that Friday evening, hoping that we could do a night of prayer and praise and worship, and then Saturday and Sunday. We're going to have something for, last two years we've done a men's conference. This year, Father put it on my heart to open this up to our families, to everybody. So uh, I'm believing for everybody, there's going to be, uh, you know, stuff where we all come together. Uh, yeah, Dr. Daryl Carr is going to come, do some health stuff. We'll do women's only stuff. We have a woman speaker lined up that I just, I can't uh, publicize just yet because we're inking out the details, but we have a female speaker. So we'll have some ladies stuff. We're going to have some kids activities, um, yeah, prayer, baptisms, uh, all kind of stuff, something for everybody. So it's still in the works, so keep it in prayer, but mark your calendars. Uh, I'm believing this week we'll make it, some of you may have even received an email. Uh, some of you that went to the men's conference in the past, maybe we got an email uh, the other day just l letting you know about this event, and uh, we will start letting people uh, book it. It's free, of course, but uh, just letting us know you're coming so we know for food and, and all that. Uh, the facilities out here will be used so people can uh, pitch a tent, pitch a camper, rent a cabin, sleep on the floor in here, whatever you got, whatever, right? We'll make it work. We always do. All right. If I could get my slides then. You know, I want to thank, can we give it up for the praise and worship team one more time? Because I think sometimes we, we, don't, we, we fail to show them the proper appreciation because, man, we are so blessed to have just the talented group that we have here to lead us in pra praise and worship. And, man, it blesses me every time I come here. I'm always, I'm always moved. And they need our prayers. So I, I just, I, I was praying for you guys this week because... We need, they need our prayers. When they're up here, they're taking some hits for us, okay? When, when you are ministering, when you're pouring yourself out, the enemy doesn't like that. So these guys are under attack when, you know, pray for your speakers, pray for your leaders here, pray for the, you know, the worship team, because, yeah, when they're putting themselves out there, uh, often we uh, make ourselves known to the enemy, and he don't like that. Okay, dead slave. What the heck is that about? All right, I like to name my uh, messages kind of like, I, I approach it like movie titles. Kind of like, ah, oh, that sounds in interesting. Maybe we'll go see that. <laughs> Let's go see dead slave. What's that about? Okay, so this message is more about identity than it really is anything. And uh, I'll let the title reveal itself uh, in, a, in a minute, I guess. I won't get ahead of myself. First, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity. I thank you for the leaders here at MNLT, and I thank you for them allowing me to speak here today. I thank you for putting this message on my heart, and I pray for each and every person here that they would be, remain, uh, have a teachable spirit, and uh, I pray you would soften their hearts to hear this message. Uh, I just, we come against the religious spirit and anything that would uh, prevent us from receiving this message, which will sound too good to be true. I thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, dead slave. We are called to be dead to self, dead to our will, dead to our selfish desires, dead to our flesh, dead to our nature, dead to sin, dead to worries, right? We, we sang, we're no longer slaves to fear. Who, who is no longer a slave to fear? Amen. Come on, that's some good news. You know, right now, kind of the last year, 
or in some months, I guess, fear has been kind of the thing sold over the airwaves, hasn't it? A lot of fear. Now, I've had the opportunity to go to Chicago, where I'm from, a couple times in the last year, and everybody there, they social distance like crazy. Like right now, if, I, if, we had, if they were watching it, if people in Chicago were watching this right now, they would freak out. I was at the jump zone in Fort Wayne yesterday. There was like 300 people in there jumping around, sweating on each other without masks. People in Chicago would be freaked out by that. They would, seriously, they would, they can't believe it. Because they're walking in fear. Every, they're suspicious of every single person that walks past them in the supermarket, like that's their potential killer. That is going to be the person that gives them COVIDs. And that person is going to kill them. And there's such a fear of man and fear of death. It's so unhealthy. We even had a family member that wouldn't come to our house for over a year saying, I'd rather be living in fear than be dead. Well, I'd rather be dead than be living in fear. <laughs> so I don't relate to that attitude at all because I'd rather be dead than be a slave to fear. No, no. No. No, thank you. Don't want that. You know, it's the enemy of our souls that wants us to be living in fear. He wants the world living in fear, and right now he is doing a banging job. He's got so many people afraid. And right now they've got to keep up in the ante, right? When they see that the fear is going down, that we're not buying into the fear, what do they do? They're like, oh, there's a new strand. You know, something. It's always something. In fact, right now the legislatures in this state are already formulating a bill that they are calling for, the next, that, for when the next pandemic happens. So our legislature is already saying, when the next pandemic happens, but it's, it's the, the conservative lawmakers are putting, they want to put something in place where they cannot prevent us from gathering, having religious gatherings during the next pandemic. So they already know there's a <laughs> pandemic, it's already in the works. <laughs> so at least we have some lawmakers that are working on our behalf for the next one. <laughs> So Matthew 6.34, right? Yeshua gives us a command. Do not worry. I, I look at it as a command. We are not to worry. So everyone's a slave. They truly are. Whether they know it or not, everyone's a slave to something. Some are, some are slaves to sin, slaves to fear. Some of us are slaves to righteousness, and we're going to get into that. All right, so what do we got? I always press the wrong button. There we go. All right, like I said, this message is about identity. 1 Corinthians 5.17. Hey, I'm going to give, this is a little hint. If you don't have this memorized, have this memorized by S September because we're going to maybe do a little uh, trivia game in here again, right? The box. Right, Brian? Brian's back. It's good to see him. <laughs> yeah. The box, brother. All right. <laughs> All right. This is going to be the answer to one of the questions in September. And you might win a big prize if you can remember 1 Corinthians 5.17. You should already have it memorized if you don't. Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I know that you guys, this, for most of you, this is not a new verse. You know this verse. But my question is, do you believe this verse? You know it, but do you believe it? Do you actually believe that you are a new creation? Do you have a new creation mindset or do you have an old creation mindset? Are you living in the past or are all things, have they all become new? I know you know this verse, but do you believe this verse? Do you believe that you are a new creation? Do you believe that you've been born again? So who do you identify? Do you identify with the new man or the old man? The old mi man mindset says, this is how I've always done it. Well, when my wife says this, this is how I react. When that guy cuts me off, this is how I've always react. That's the old mindset. That's the old you. Are you going to keep living in the old you? I got Bible that says that I'm a new creation. The old things have gone. They've passed. They're dead. They're buried, right? That's why we, we get born again. We get baptized, right, in faith. And speaking of baptisms, I brought my swimming trunks today. I never bring my swimming trunks to MNLT. But I brought them today because I feel like one of you is supposed to get baptized today, and I'm not here to manipulate you, but if you're just saying to yourself right now, that's weird that he brought that up because this morning that thought crossed my mind. Then I believe I'm speaking to you. And if you are not afraid of the water, I'm not either. I mean, I can, we can do this today. Right? Today's the day of salvation, so we can get baptized today. So, hey, 
You got, I, I've, I've been to baptisms where they broke, broke through ice. All right? It ain't that bad. All right. <laughs> all right, so see me afterwards if I was just talking to you. All right. So the new man looks to the present and the future, right? The old man is looking in the past. Philippians 3.13 says this, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if it anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. So my prayer is that God will reveal this to you. If you don't have this in your mind, to reach forward, right? Paul is saying, I'm not looking back. I'm reaching forward. I'm pressing on ahead. That is what the new mindset's supposed to do. So how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as the old person? I'm just a sinner. I'm just this. I'm that. You know, my mama didn't love me, and she always said this about me, right? Those old lies. This is about mindset. This is about the lies. We've inherited lies, and we need to crush these things. By the blood of Yeshua, by his power, we can put these things in our past and go and move forward. So I asked you, how does God, so how do you see yourself? But better yet, how does God see you? Do your thoughts about yourself line up with your creator's thoughts about you? That's what I want you to really challenge you with today. I want you to think about that. Do you see yourself the way the creator of the world sees you? Because this is going to affect how we act how we, and, and what we do. It's going to affect our spiritual life. And this has been revolutionary in my life. Some of you are trying to change the old man. You're, you're living as the old man, and you're trying to change the old man. You're trying to tame him. Some of you identify as Sabbath keepers or Torah keepers, or I don't know what you identify with, but many churches are preaching to the old man, right? We have this sloppy grace message in churches, right? Come as you are, stay as you are. And that's not welcome here. You could come as you are, but you ain't supposed to be walking out these doors the same way you walked in. All right? You must be born again. We're, we need to become new creations. Some are trying to modify or train the old man to behave. You know, well, maybe God will love me if, if, he, if I start keeping the Sabbath better or do this or do that better. No, no, no. The old man needs to die. You need to be born again. We are called to be dead slaves, not carnal masters, okay? That is what we're called to be, dead slaves. All right. So how do we get there? How do we do that? Living sacrifices. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, right? In the Old Testament, we see over and over again, they would kill the animal. They'd put it on the fire, put it on the altar, right? Well, you are to be a living sacrifice. You, yourself, are responsible for crawling up on that altar yourself and doing it yourself, offering yourself as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Some translations have uh, act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how are we not going to be transformed by this, or look like this world, conformed to the pattern of this world, right? Conform means to, to, to be the form of. How do we do that? The transforming and the renewing of our mind, okay? God wants to circumcise our hearts, but he doesn't circumcise our minds, we need to renew our minds. The battle is in the mind. And that's what you're going to see in this message. I hope that is your takeaway, that the battle is in the mind. And that's why we will have to take every thought captive. Then you'll be able to test and approve what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Some of you cannot test and approve what is the good, pleasing, perfect will of God because you have not been transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've been conformed to the pattern of the world, and we cannot afford to do that. We have to die daily as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Galatians 5, 25 says this, and those who are in Messiah's, th those who are in Messiah have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. All right? So when we die daily, we crucify the flesh, its passions, its desires, and then we can walk in the spirit. And then Galatians 5, 16 says, so I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So when we, when we destroy our fleshly desires, when we take thought, those thoughts captive, and that's where all these sins start. All the sins start here. They all start in the mind. The battle is in the mind. Galatians 4, 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. His spirit has come into our hearts, right? You always heard, you know, invite Jesus in your heart. 
right? He comes into our hearts, but yet, again, we have to control our minds. It is up here that the battle is fought. This is where the enemy is trying to get a foothold in your mind to cause you to start thinking that stinking thinking, to get you to think wrong thoughts, to believe lies that were told to you by either him, even by yourself. Many of you, again, are still identifying as your old self. Well, I'm just a this and that. Oh, I guess I'll just always be. You know, they said I'd be just like my dad. When I go into prisons, I ask all the men, how many people said you were going to be like your daddy? Have, you know, half the hands go up. That is a curse because their dad was a bum. So now they feel like, well, my dad was a bum. I guess I don't have a chance. I'm going to be a bum. You know, and if that's what, how you're going to think, yeah, you're going to go that way. This is, a, this is a faith thing. It starts in the mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, yeah, we tear down arguments and every presumption set against the knowledge of God, and we take, caught, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Messiah. So we have to tear down arguments and every presumption set against the knowledge of God. We have to take these thoughts captive. That's what we got to do. Because here's our calling. I just said, we're called to be a new creation. Are you called to be a new creation? I just showed it, right? We're called to be a new creation. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, 17. What about holy? Are you called to be holy? Yeah. yeah, you are called to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 16, be holy because I am holy. What about perfect? Are you called to be perfect? Oh, you're not too sure about that. Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You're like, man, you are raising the bar, man. You're calling me to be a new creation. Now I got to be holy. Now I got to be perfect. Come on. Guess what else? You got to be dead to sin, right? Romans 6, 1 says, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Certainly not. How can we who died to sin live it any longer? We don't live in sin when we've died to sin. Right? We don't live in it any longer. All right. What about walking in the Spirit? Yes, we are called to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live by the Spirit, we should also walk by the Spirit. So let me ask this. Are you called to be everything God says you are? Yes. Okay, well, God's called you to be a new creation. He's called you to be holy. He's called you to be perfect. He's called you to be dead to sin. He's called you to walk in the Spirit. And many of us, too many of us, are trying to do this in our own strength. And guess what? You can't do it. So that's why a lot of you have already just said, well, I can't do it. So you've given up. But yeah, you can't do it. But I got Bible that says you can do all things through Messiah. So through him, you can do all these things. This is the only way you can become perfect. The only way you can become holy. The only way you can become a new creation is through him. None of your good works will do that. And you're also called to be slaves. Romans 6.22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. We are called to be slaves to God. The fruit you reap leads to holiness and the outcome is eternal life. Hallelujah. Right? He is our Adonai. He is our Lord. He is our master. This is slave language. He is the master. That means we listen to him. That means we have, that we are the slaves and that we will obey him and do what he calls us to be. You know what you're also called to do? You're also called to be righteous. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, since we have been justified, right? Justified, just as, you have, as, just as if you've never sinned, you've been made righteous through his faithfulness combined with our faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Yeshua Messiah. Okay, let's look at this verse. All right, so we've been made righteous. We've been made righteous because we, became, because we are so good? No, through his faithfulness, not alone, combined with our faith. We have to combine our faith with his, with his uh, faithfulness. So it takes our faith, our belief. We have to believe it. If you don't believe it, if you don't apply faith to it, it's not going to happen. And many of you don't have peace with God because you haven't received this in faith, that you are righteous, made righteous, that you have the righteousness of Messiah. If I ask most people today, are you a sinner or a saint? A lot of people, oh, you know, I'm just a sinner, man. I'm just, no, no. Sinners will not have any part in the kingdom of Elohim, okay? There, is, there, will, no, there will not be sinners there. If you're going to look for sinners there, you'll be disappointed. They won't be there. Your chance to witness to them is here. It won't be there. 2 Corinthians 5.19, For God was in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Okay. No longer counting people's sins against them. Woo, that is good news. He's no longer counting our sins against us. So here's what we should st stop doing today. Let's stop counting our sins against us. 
How about we stop counting our sins against our brothers and sisters? Because you know what? That's the accuser's job. He is the accuser of the brethren. So let's stop helping him. Let's stop accusing. Let's start looking, when, let's start looking at each other the way our father sees each other. Because you know what? When I pray that prayer and I say, Father, help me to see your stubborn people the way you do because I want to give them a slap sometimes. All right? So when I ask Father to show me my brothers and sisters through his eyes, oh my goodness, I can love people that I couldn't normally love. I can, see, I, I can see past the filth and the junk and the sins, okay? And I can see them the way he sees them. And I no longer count their sins against them because he doesn't either. And so many of us are counting our sins against us. So many of you are missing your calling because you're living in an old creation mindset. Your old man is saying, uh-uh-uh, you can't minister to them. Remember what you did? He's reminding you of your old man. That's your old creation mindset. You are a new creation. That thing is dead, it's buried, it's gone. But you have to apply faith to that. If you don't apply your faith to it, then, it's worth, then it doesn't do anything. Then you're powerless. Then you're gonna live in the old mindset. You have to apply it in faith. We have to take the thoughts captive. All right, where am I? All right. So according to this, I'm righteous. I'm going to ask everyone here that believes they're righteous to repeat after me. I am righteous. Let's do this. I am righteous. Okay, now that sounds pretty self-righteous of you to say. <laughs> okay? Religious people hate when people who are walking in freedom say that they're righteous. So if you're walking in a religious spirit right now, you're all uppity going, ugh, who does he think he is? He's all self-righteous. No. Because my righteousness comes from above. It is not from me. I didn't do anything to become righteous except apply my faith to his promises. And that's the thing. These are not just empty words on a page, guys. These are promises. And you have to grab hold of these promises and know that they're true. You have to not just know it, but you also have to believe it. You truly have to believe it. And some of you only know it and don't believe it. Because it's too good to be true. I know. It is. It's too good to be true. So sometimes it's hard to believe. I get it. But you're righteous. You truly are. So some of you are saying, well, if I'm righteous, then why do I do what I do? And Paul struggled with this, right? He even said, oh, why do I, you know, I do the good, you know, I don't do the good that I know I ought to do, right? Paul was struggling it, with it. Because yes, we're still wearing flesh suits, okay? We still have flesh. And this is a daily thing. We climbed on that altar yesterday. Guess what? I got to climb on it again today. And tomorrow I'm going to have to probably climb on it again. It's a daily activity, okay? It's not one and done. So faith, right? He's, it's combined with our faith. Well, where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So many of you are having a faith problem because some of you aren't in the word of God. And some of you, I would ask you today, what are you listening to? What is coming into your ears? What are you putting in your head? What music are you listening to? What, what teachers are you listening to? Okay, if you're listening to, you know, the, the false prophets on TV, you know, the false, the false prophets of CNN every day, yeah, you're going to start living in fear. You will. That is what they're selling. They're not going to build up your faith. We need to hear more words of faith. So are the voices you're listening to, are they building up your faith or are they snuffing it out? So I, would I think some of us need to really take a long look at what we're listening to. What are we reading? Because like I said, we have peace with God. Many of you might not have peace with God. And it's because we haven't combined our faith to this, to this promise that we've been justified, that we've been made righteous. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, so if you're walking around kicking yourself in the pants, I'm unrighteous, I'm no good. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Because I got Bible that says the unrighteous are not going to be in the kingdom. Okay? Do not be deceived. That's a warning. Deception takes place in your mind. It's up here in the head. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, nor covetous or drunkards, nor revelers, nor ex whatever that word is, will inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Yeshua by the Spirit of our God. Okay, let me unpack that. Okay, so does that mean... Some of you were fornicators. Some of you did this and that. Some of you, I don't even care what's on that list. That list, just anyone that, you know, you can make that list a mile long. I'm not going to pick on the sin, okay? But he says, such were some of you. He's writing to the Corinthians who are 
the, the largest like sex temple in the, in, in the world was in Corinth. These people had sex problems and sexual issues because if you read the whole, both letters, right, he, he reveals that there's some sex issues in the church in Corinth, right? Because that's one of the issues they were dealing with in that area, okay? So, but he's saying, that's not what you are anymore. That's such were some of you. That's what you were. Now, you might fall into that. You might be tempted to do that. But that's not your identity. Your identity can't be found in your sin, in the thing you're tempted with, the thing that you struggle with in your flesh. That can't be your identity. That's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Yeshua and by the Spirit of our God. So now you have a new identity. Your identity is now in my in Messiah. It's not in the sin that you used to do. And the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the age today, is telling people, telling our young people, to find their identity in what they're attracted to or what they think, what they believe, right? Whatever they want to be. And we have to be compassionate and loving to these people because they're deceived. It says, do not be deceived. They're deceived. They were dece they're deceived just the way many of us were deceived. Whenever, whatever sin we were in, they're deceived just the same way that we were. So they need our love and compassion, Okay, we might not fully understand because we are not dealing with the problems they are, you know, the deception that they're in and the identity struggles they're having, but we've all had identity issues. Maybe you had abuse in your past. Maybe you had, you know, I don't, it doesn't even matter what it was, but I know you guys had an old man, old creation identity problem, and some of you are struggling with it. This is all about identity, and that's why the enemy is trying to encourage our young people to embrace the wrong identity. That's really what the, the enemy's trying to do is trying to get them to run towards that and embrace that identity, telling them, then you'll be set free from worrying about what everyone thinks once you embrace this false identity. And that's the lie. And we have to help our, our brothers and sisters and our young people to not embrace and believe these lies. And we need to do it with love and compassion. So when Paul's writing to them, is he looking at them through their sin nature or, or as a new creation? He look, he's looking at them as a new creation, Right? As such were some of you. He's saying, that's, that's not who you are. That's not who you are anymore. If you identify as one of these things, then yes, you're deceived. And being deceived is believing something that's not true. It's believing the lies. They have forgotten who they are. And that's what's happened to many of us. Some of us have forgotten who we really are in the eyes of our creator. We've forgotten the promises. And we haven't applied our faith to it. The things you struggle with are not who you are. Does anyone, ever, does anyone here still struggle with some sin? I'm the only one, okay. Gosh, man, tough crowd. Yeah, holy. All right. <laughs> All right. That is your struggle that you're having, that struggle you're having in your flesh is not your identity. It's not who you are. The enemy is going to try to tell you that's who you are, and that way you'll walk in condemnation. And this way you won't run to the Father. This way you're going to just, you're going to actually retreat from the Father. And that's what the, Satan, that, that's what the enemy is trying to do. He's trying to get you to identify with the sin that you're struggling with. And this way you will not come to the Father because you'll feel like you're just not good enough to come to him. How can he love a sinner like me? So then you're just going to condemn yourself and isolate yourself. And that's how the enemy gets you. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he says, He made the one not having known sin, right, Yeshua, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, that's our righteousness. We have, we, are becoming, we have become the righteousness of God. So walking around, you're not going to walk a righteous life unless you have the faith that you are righteous. That's why it's not self-righteous for you. We, we've kind of turned it into this thing like, oh, he's so self-righteous. No, you have to believe that you're righteous or you'll never walk in righteousness. You won't. You just won't. I promise you. So you have to believe it. Again, the righteousness is the righteousness of God. It's not my self-righteousness because I'm the best darn Torah keeper in the room. It's because of what he did, not because of anything we've done, right? Okay. Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. There it is. It's not my own righteousness, okay? It's right there in our Bibles, which is of the law, right? My own righteousness comes in how good of a Torah keeper I am, all right? So I don't want to be judged upon my own righteousness. No, it's not my righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Messiah, the righteousness which is of God by faith. 
There we have that word again, faith. It has to be that you believe. If you don't believe it up here, then you can't apply your faith to the righteousness. To know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, right? So being in the form of his death. So again, this takes faith, and we are righteous by faith. You must believe you're righteous. I know for some of you, it might just seem like psychobabble, like, oh, so if I just believe something enough times, it'll become true. No, that's not it, okay? You can believe that you can fly off, jump off, air, jump off buildings. You'll never jump off buildings and fly, no matter how much you believe it. I'm not telling you to trick yourself. I'm telling you to put your faith in the word of God, that every word of this is true, and you have to believe it with every single fiber of your being. Yes, you got to put our trust in his word. Amen. All right, I'm on slide eight, going to nine. All right. So slaves. I talked about we're, we are also called to be slaves. Matthew 20, 25 says, But Yeshua called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you, he will be your slave. So we are called to be slaves. Now that word uh, for servant there, is uh, di, di, uh, diakonos, uh, diakonos. Why am I saying it so wrong? I had, it, I had this down earlier. Di, diakonos. Thank you. Diakonos. All right? And this is, a, is a, a call to a life serving others. And we know that Yeshua was the best servant because he came to serve, not to be served, right? That word for slave there is doulos, and it is a call to be a slave. Slaves to one another, not, in, not enslaved by the world. All right, so here we go with more slave language here. Romans 6, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, right? We do not want to be slaves to sin, it results in death, or to obedience re- resulting in righteousness. Yes, we want to be slaves to obedience, which results in righteousness. But thanks be to God that through, uh, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So like I said, everyone's a slave. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. So I want righteousness to be my master. I want to be a slave to righteousness, and, and I believe that's what you all want too. Too many are enslaved by this world and the lust of the world. First John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And that's what so many people are, and, and, and most of you or all of you were at one time, we were enslaved by the world, right? We were just following worldly things, worldly ways, our carnal flesh. And so we ended up being slaves to sin, slaves to our flesh, and we were slaves to this world. To truly be free, we must be a slave to God. And guess what? His yoke is easy. His burden is light. So, uh, so yeah, the word slave there, doulos, this is from uh, Strong's Concordance. It says, someone who belongs to another, a bond slave, without any ownership rights of their own. So when you become a slave, you let go of your rights. Your right to be offended, your right to be angry. You let go of all rights. It's used with the highest dignity in the New Testament. Man, we serve an upside down kingdom, don't we? I mean, everything's just like opposite in God's kingdom. Being a slave in the New Testament, when we see being a slave to one another, being a slave to righteousness, being a slave to God, that in the New Testament is considered the highest honor. Namely, of believers who willingly live under Messiah's authority as his devoted followers. And look at this. So we have a lot of translations use the word servants. In fact, I couldn't even find a translation that used the word slave here. In Philippians 1.1, every Bible I saw, if you have a Bible that says different, I'd like to hear it. But uh, it says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Messiah Yeshua. That word right there is actually slave. They put servant there because I think they think that we have such a, a, a warped mind of the word slave. Especially in this country, we think of slave, we think of Africans brought over in chains in the South picking cotton, right? Harriet Tubman. This is like what we think of when we think of slaves. So we have this mental depiction. So I think a lot of Bibles end up using the word servant here. But we are really called to be slaves of Messiah Yeshua. And these other Bible verses right here, Colossians 4, 12, James 1, 1, 1 Peter 2, 16, these all actually have the word servant in their Bibles, but the Greek word is actually slave. 
So James 1.1, 1, 1, if you go there, it's like these guys are greeting themselves as slaves, as a slave of Messiah. So when they're a slave, they have given up all their rights. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men, right? We don't want to be, when we're a slave of, of, of men, and, and what this means is like the worldly men, right? To the Gentiles, to the nations. When you are concerned about what people think about you, when you're worried about what people are going to say, you're a slave of men. They own you. You're not walking out your calling because you're afraid of what they're going to say or what they're going to think. And I've wrestled with this many times. Man, I've had words for people that, you know, at checkout lanes and different things, and I'm like, eh, I can't say that. She's going to think I'm crazy. And then I have, I'm like having this mental battle. I'm like, but she doesn't know me, and she's never going to see me again. So I got that working for me. <laughs> I could just say it and run away. <laughs> So, but I, you know, I mean, just, just like Peter, you know, Peter's like, uh, I never do him, you know, to a little girl. And it's, I, I've, I've, I've wrestled with that, fear of man. And no, I don't want to be a slave to men. You were bought with the highest price in heaven. The blood of Yeshua is what purchased you, okay? He purchased you so that you would belong to him. But here's the thing. He's actually given you a choice. Even though he bought you with the highest price that could ever be paid in the entire universe, he's still giving you a way out. He's still letting you Go your own way. Even though no other slave master would do that. No other master would do that. When they bought you, they bought you. They wouldn't let you just go your own way. Like, hey, I bought you, but, you know, do what you want. No. But he'll do that. He'll let you go. He'll let you go. But there's no better master than him. There's no, there's nothing better than being a slave to, to our God. So yes, Yeshua is our master. So I believe in lordship salvation, right? A lot of people believe in this easy believism stuff. As long as you just, you know, think the right doctrines, you're, you know, you're saved. No. If we are going to call on Lord, then he is our master. That's what we're saying when we're, call, when we're saying Lord. Adonai, when we're, we're shouting out Lord, we're, we're saying master, essentially. Luke 4, 6, 46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I do, or not do what I say? Right? It's a contradiction. If you're calling me Lord, you're going to do what, I, what I'm telling you to do. If I'm your master, if, if you're the slave and I'm the master, then you will do exactly what I say. So what, he was, what Yeshua was saying in Luke 6, 46 is, he's like, I'm not your Lord. And this is why we do what we do. We're not trying to earn our salvation. Since he's our master, since we're slaves to him, then we are going to do what he says because it becomes our desire to serve him and do what he says. But yes, if we, if we need the approval of others, if we need affirmation from other people, yeah, we're going to become slaves of men. And we have to be careful of that. All right, servants. So we're called to be slaves. We're also called to be servants. So that must be our, our identity must be in being a slave and also being a servant. I didn't put a Bible verse here. Good gravy. All right, Yeshua called the 12 and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all, right? Again, that upside down kingdom. This world has it completely backwards to Messiah's kingdom. In Messiah's kingdom, if you want to be first, you have to decrease and become last. If you want to be great, you have to serve. So this word servant is diokonos. Man, I'm having a hard time with my Greek today. Okay, diokonos. Dia means thoroughly, and knos, uh, knos means dust. You're like, thoroughly dust? What's that to do with being a servant? It means to thoroughly raise up dust by moving in a hurry, as so when ministering. That's what that means. That's where the word deacon comes from, right? So our deacons are servants that are moving so fast serving everybody that they're kicking up dust everywhere they go in order to serve people. Get that mental image in your head next time when you think about deacons. That's what we're called to do. We are called to be servants. Philippians 2, your attitude should be the same as that of Messiah Yeshua, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Right? That's what we are called to do, just like him. Right? Our attitude should be the same, taking on that attitude that we are nothing without him emptying ourselves out so he could fill us up. We don't want any of us in us. We want him in us. We got to get out of the way. 
So do not, con did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Our Lord and Savior came down and humbled himself in the form of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that is the template. If we, want, we, we say we want to walk like Yeshua walked, then we must walk as servants. Considering others better than ourselves, as Paul writes in Philippians, I believe. Conclusion. You guys are like, what? He's flying through this. He's like, it usually takes two hours. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Messiah Yeshua for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word workmanship is the Greek word poema. That is where we get the English word poem. Okay? When you, when you write a poem, you don't sloppily just put something together. It's an artist who puts a poem together. Okay? So this word workmanship, a lot of Bible translations have craftsmanship. We are crafted by this, ex, this artisan. That, that, that is what this word implies, that it is an artisan crafting something together. Not just putting it together, but crafting it in an artistic way, like a poem. All right? We are his poema. We're his craftsmanship. He didn't just slop you together. He intricately put you together piece by piece. Okay? And why did he do that? You were created, your identity should be in Yeshua so that you can do good works which God prepared beforehand. There are good works in advance that he's prepared for us to do and so many times we miss it because our identity is, we're focused on ourselves, saying, you know, we're focused on our flesh, our carnal desires, instead of seeing ourselves who he is. And this takes work. You might have to wake up every morning and say, Father, help me to see me the way you see me. Because I'm looking through these flesh eyes, and I see a bunch of flesh, and I don't see what you see. And help me to see my brothers and sisters the way you see them. I want to love them the way you love them. When Yeshua resurrected and he, and, and he left, he, he told his disciples, he said, it's better for me to go. Okay? It is actually, the earth is a better place with Yeshua not on it. Wrap your mind around that for a second. The world's a better place without Yeshua. He said, it's better for me to leave. It's better that he's gone. Now, if we took a survey here and we asked, how many people would rather have Yeshua in the room right now? I'm pretty sure most people would raise their hand, I'd rather have Yeshua in the room. But it's actually better that he's not. Because instead of one Yeshua being in the room, there's a hundred Yeshuas in the room. Because if he is, because now his spirit then poured out in all flesh, and now his spirit's in each and every one of us, and now we're the body. Now his body, can, now there can be one billion Yeshua bodies all over the earth right now, could be ministering all over the earth where he was bound in space and time in, in flesh in one place. Now he can be everywhere. But the reason we say we'd rather have Yeshua here is because we're not really doing a good job of being the body. If we start doing a better job of being the body, then the earth will truly be, will fulfill what he said and it'll actually be a better place without him. Because there'll be a whole bunch of Yeshuas, a whole bunch of Christians, Christ-like followers walking around being his hands and feet. Instead of squabbling and fighting and arguing and, and being... You know, you know, spec finders instead of fruit inspectors. You know, we, we got we to come off that. Proverbs 31.10, for you ladies, right? It says you're more precious than rubies. And I know some of you have been hurt, and you didn't have a good dad. You weren't loved. Your husband divorced you. Whatever the problems are, I'm sensitive to that. But you've got to know that you are more precious than rubies. Psalm 139.14 says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Again, we have the perfect craftsman, this artisan, who put us together. He knew what he was doing. And he, he put us here for such a time as this. He put you so you can, he put you here during pandemic season so that you can be a light in your neighborhood to everyone who's freaking out. But we have to move from knowing who we are to actually believing it. When you, learned how, when you taught your kids how to learn to ride a bike, were you pushing them going, you can't do it, you're gonna crash, <laughs> you're gonna die. 
Who did that? If you did, I just want to know. You did, Brian? You are a horrible parent. <laughs> you are a masochist. What is wrong with you? <laughs> no, what did you tell your kids? You got this. You can do it. And then what happened when they crashed? You're like, and they're going, I can't do it. And you're like, you were doing it. You were doing it. What are you doing? You're actually putting faith in them. You're actually trying to convince them to put their thoughts in, 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 in with line with reality, what was true. Because they were actually believing a lie. They're believing a lie that they can't do it. Everyone can ride a bike if you got legs, okay? All right, you can ride a bike. Every kid can ride a bike. But, they, but no kid thinks they could ride a bike just about. So you have to convince them to believe that they can. And once they start to believe, they put their faith in it and, and keep pedaling, going, okay, I'm gonna just trust and I'm gonna believe and I'm gonna put faith in this thing that I'm not gonna crash because my dad or my mom keeps telling me I got this. And that's what we need. And that's what our meetings should be. We don't just come here, sing a few songs, you know, ear-tickling sermon, learn some Hebrew, eat a meal, and Shabbat Shalom our way out of here. Okay, if that's all we're doing, then you are missing the point of this gathering today. Okay, you really are. Don't leave here without encouraging somebody today. Because who, who, who here, does, who needs some encouraging today? All right, I need some encouraging. I need to be reminded of who I am. You need to be reminded of who you are. Okay, and so it's like, we're, 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 that's what we're in this race together. He brought us here together. It's a miracle that some of you even found this place or, or found each other, right? And he's knitting our hearts together and we're becoming family and we're doing these feasts together and we spend every, you know, we carve a day out and spend a whole day each week with each other so we can also encourage each other to run this race and remind each other who we are in Messiah because all week the world's telling me what a piece of bleep I am and this and that and sometimes I drag my butt in here on Saturday half believing the lies have been fed all week. And sometimes I need to remind you that I'm a child of God, that I made it in his image. So I need that, and you need that, and that's why he's brought us together. That's why we can't walk this race alone. That's why we're not called to walk in Messiah alone, okay? It's great, some people wanna sit in their basement and watch 119 ministry videos all, all Sabbath by themselves, but that, those people will never grow into their full potential and their calling. They won't, because we need each other. We have to do this together because we need to encourage each other. If you're gonna walk out your righteousness, you need to believe it. And you can do this, I know you can. We can do it together and we can do it through him because I got Bible that we can do all things through Messiah. When we believe our calling, we will walk differently. Some of you have had a hard time receiving love. There's been people I've prayed over here, you know, here before that I've like, just poured my heart on and God wanted me to tell them how much the Father loves them and they didn't believe what I told them. They're like, ah, I can't, I don't, I know, I hear what you're saying, I know it's true, but I can't receive it. I, I know, I get it. You've been hurt. You weren't loved. And so it's hard to receive love. When I go into prisons, I don't preach loving father in prisons. Because none of the men there know what a loving father looks like. Every one of their fathers was a bum SOB that they want nothing to do with. So it's hard to preach loving father to a bunch of people that don't know what loving father looks like. So I get it. A lot of us have a hard time receiving the love of the father, but it's an identity issue. Okay, he has circumcised your hearts, but we need to work on our brains. We need to get these thoughts right. We need to put our faith into these promises, into, these, into his word. This thing is not just an instruction book, folks. It is a love letter. And he's telling, and I, you know, when I come here, I, I prefer to talk about the good, you know, how good God is. This message is kind of focused on us, but we got to get our minds straight. We got to get our minds thinking right, or else this is not going to really have its full value, and then we're not gonna be able to be the body that he's called us to be. We're not gonna be able to be a people that walk in power if we walk around dragging our butts saying, I'm no darn good, how can God ever use a sinner like me? Okay? So that's the old man thinking. That's your old, you are a new creation, and you have to really walk in this new creation mindset. If you're gonna walk in power and love, God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but we got all these people walking in fear, right? He's giving us a spirit of power and love. But so many, so many of us can't receive the power and love because of our identities. We're still walking, we're, we're still, we're trying to like, you know, shape up or clean up the old man. The old man has to die. You need to come out of that water of baptism and be born again, a new creation. And hold on to that promise every day. Every day, you, you might need to remind yourself that every day. I kind of keep thinking about that Saturday Night Live skit, like with Stuart Smalley. What would he say? He'd like look in the mirror and like, I'm good enough, I'm strong enough. Well, I forget what he would do. But, and yeah, <laughs> people like me. 
Okay, if you need to look in the mirror and do that, then whatever it takes, <laughs> whatever, whatever gets you, <laughs> whatever gets you there, okay? All right. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another every day, while it is still called today, so that not one of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Did you hear that? Encourage one another every day, so that not one of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So, so many of us are being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin because we're not being encouraged every day. We need to be the greatest Messiah cheerleaders and the greatest cheerleaders for each other. And sometimes we're the worst cheerleaders. Sometimes we are some of the most stubborn, backbiting people. Ask some of the leaders here. They, they got a couple sheep bites, I'm sure, right? All right. <laughs> We've got a couple shepherds across America that have a lot of sheep bites, right? A lot of backbiting, a lot of arguing, bickering. We need to, we need to be, we're supposed to be known for our love for one another. But yet the world, I think, knows us for our hypocrisy and our backbiting and our, and our double talk. We, it says to encourage one another every day so that not one of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So that's on us. It's on us to encourage one another. So we need to be reminded of our value, our purpose, and our identity in Messiah. So we need to be, where was that slide at? I'll go back to it. All right, we're called to be a new creation. We're called to be holy. We're called to be perfect. So next time you feel that God's calling you to do something, and your first thought is, well, I can't do that because I, I fill in the blank. That thought's not from God. That's the enemy trying to stop you from walking in your calling. You've been called to do something, and you're like, yeah, I got this. Because my God he called me to do it. He equips the called. He's called you to do all these things, so he's equipped you to do all these things. He's called you to be righteous. He's called you to be perfect. Yes, in our own strength, in our own flesh, we never will. And that's why we have to take all these thoughts captive. We're called to be servants, so we should be serving one another. I'll leave you with this. Matthew 25, 21. This is all I ever want to hear. This is, this is why I do what I do. I just want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. My master, because I'm a slave to him. He's my master, and that's all I want to hear. I just want to hear that one day. My kids and I, we were going through Matthew 25 last week, and I, I broke out in tears. I said, this is all I want to do. This is all I want to hear. I'm doing every single thing in my life just to hear those words. That's all I want to hear. That's it. I just want to hear faithful servant. Good job. Here, you were faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I want to share my master's happiness for eternity. And I believe that you guys do too. All right. Well, thanks for letting me speak. I'm going to close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I, I just come against the spirit of religion that says, no, that says we can't be perfect, we can't be righteous, that we can't be holy. I take every thought captive right now, and me and my brothers are going to walk in our identity in you. You have made us righteous. You have called us to be righteous. You have made us holy by the blood of Yeshua, and we are called to be holy, and we will walk in holiness, and we will be holy in your sight. You have called us to walk in your spirit. You've called us to be slaves and servants, and we will do your bidding. We will do what you've called us to do, even though we know we can't do it in our flesh, but we can do all things through you. And we thank you for filling us with your Holy Spirit that enables us to be able to do these things that are impossible to do on our own. And I thank you so much in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Would you stand to receive the blessing? It's taken from Numbers 6, 22 through 27. And it states, Then the Lord said to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Yisrael, you shall say to them. So I'll do it in Hebrew, and then we'll do it in English. So uh, here it is. Yevareka, Yahweh. Vish Murecha Yahweh Yahweh Penhabeleka Vichumneka Yisa Yahweh Panahabeleka 
וישם לך, לך שלום. Then in English, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face, his countenance upon you, and grant you his shalom, his peace in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Shahar Shalom, Hu Adonai. In the name of Yeshua, Messiah, the Prince of Peace, you are Lord. We give you all the praise in your name. And everybody said, Amen. Right now we're going to have, well, given a few more minutes, we're going to have uh, Oneg, a, a fellowship meal. You did not have to have bring, brought something. Please just join us, and if you have any questions, Victor will be glad to answer any questions you have. <laughs>